Righty ho. Welcome everyone to this BSAA webinar. My name is Susan Mumford and I am the founder of Be Smart About Art, where art professionals learn how to achieve a successful career doing what you love. As we say, art is your life, make it your living. Today we are delighted to welcome on board social media expert Karen Lerner. Hi Karen. Hi Susan. So Karen is the director of Top Left Design. Her mission is to clean up the internet and empower clients to represent and promote themselves in a way that makes them proud. That's a fantastic focus. So our focus today is isolated in cyberspace, get more traffic, measure success, and know what to expect. So this is a half hour webinar, in which case we encourage our viewers to send in questions that you might have for us. So if you do have a question you'd like to ask, please type it into the comment box below the video screen on your what on your browser and we'll endeavor to answer those questions. To get us started straight off, Karen, I've got a key question for you and that is why would somebody start a blog in the first place? The way I usually put it is the comparison of a website that has a blog as part of the website compared to a website that doesn't have a blog at all. If you have a, right. a, a website, a normal standard website, it would have all the normal links of a website, home, about, case studies, your services or products, and your contact page, which gives people all the information they need, but it doesn't prove anything. If you add a blog, that's the place where you can reinforce the key messages you have about your business. You can prove all the things you want people to believe about you. If you want people to believe that you're an expert in your field, you can use your blog to give advice and show examples of the successes you've had. Mm. If you want people to see how great your work is, you can use your blog to showcase all the different work that you've done. So having a blog allows you to do that. In addition, it's also a great way to build on relationships you've got. So I often use my blog as a place for me to interview other professionals and feature them. Mm. When they want to be promoted, they get promoted by me on my blog, and they love me even more and promote my business. Absolutely, I can completely see that. So blogs can be really interactive with your with your peers as well, and helping promote each other's businesses. Is that is that what you're saying there? There are so many benefits to having a blog. It's the part of the website that will change more most regularly. It's the reason that people are pulled back into your website, which otherwise would mainly stay. It's the part that will make you more interesting on social media because you'll be sharing your own unique content. It allows. Mm. The higher likelihood of finding you because you'll be creating more and more content online. So it's extremely powerful to have a blog on. Well, that's fantastic. And I think the fact that you're saying you're really underlining the importance of the blog being actually in the same location as that website as well. So it's all integrated. That's really important. I think so many people have not yet done that. That's true. A lot of people have a link to their blog and it opens up in a new window on their website. And, you know, the problem with that is that if people were to leave, leave the website and they just on the blog, then they're not really getting the other stuff that's about your business, which is really you want people to find out about your products and services and contact details. And if you have a website that has, has a blog, people arrive at your website and they see latest headlines, they could mm. meet with you a lot more because they're reading one blog post after another. A lot of people I speak to, have already read my blog post by the time they first contact, and they spend a lot longer on my website because of that. How interesting! So it's great for SEO. It's keeping people on the website longer. It's really telling a personal story. So clearly, blogs can have multiple benefits for, I would say, professionals in general. And certainly today, we're talking about particular artists, galleries, and art professionals. So. What would you say is the most common mistake that people make when they start a blog? There are loads of mistakes. I guess the first most common one is neglect. So people have a website and they add a blog and then when you go to their website, the last post they put out is months ago. And it makes it look like you neglected your marketing or nothing's happening in your business or you don't care about how you appear. 
Uh, so if you're going to have a blog, it is a commitment. There are all these benefits, and the only, if you want to call it a drawback, the only drawback is that you have to keep blogging. doesn't mean that you should see it as a chore. You should see it as a joyous part of your marketing, and it should be an opportunity to share what's going on inside your business. But there are, and there are ways to plan ahead and batch your tasks and think of ideas along the way, and you'll get better and better at it. But the biggest, the biggest mistake is neglect. And biggest mis mm, biggest mistake is neglect, and there was definitely a tweetable in there as well when you said a blog should be the joyous part of your marketing. I love that. You'll, if you get into the, into it and you start thinking, I must write a blog about that. I'll need to blog about that. Everything that happens to blog about, every question you get asked over and over again, you can turn it into a blog post. Every interesting thing that happens during your day, you can turn it into a blog post. Every little, tiny little detail, you can create a blog post. Um, the next big mistake people have, people make, uh, is the way that they present their blog. And especially for artists and gallerists, presentation is really important. So where you take all the time to hang things correctly and bring the right groupings and with the right type of frames and everything else, the same thing should be applied to your blog. Uh, presentation is really important. So I can give you a few tips if you'd like. We would love some tips on presentation of blog because as you say, we're talking about art businesses here and that brand, that visual strength needs to come through in every single aspect of an artist's and gallerist's practice. So tell us please, what, what can art professionals do visually speaking? Okay, visually speaking, the first thing is that every post you put up should have a picture. So it looks really boring when you don't have a picture and I doubt that any of the artists and gallerists ever post a blog without a picture. The nature of your work. But I have seen many posts out in pictures that just doesn't work well. It isn't shareable. It's less visual. People are less, are less likely to want to. That's the first tip. You always use a picture. The second thing is about the size of the image. It looks really bad when you have this, the image to be like half the width of the column of text that it sits. It should be the same width of that column of text and really in line with how oh, I'm holding up. Here. So here, <laughs> like that, yeah. Underneath there, it should be the same width. It looks uh, bad when you have a little picture in the middle and then a column of text underneath or above that's that's wrong. It doesn't work and it looks pokey and weird. So make sure that you size your images to be the same as the width of your content. Um, I often measure that for people using Photoshop. So I, I'd love to offer anyone who's watching a free resizing service or free measure, measuring service. So that means that you show me your blog and I'll tell you the pixels that each one needs. Excellent. Yeah. That's a really top tip and hopefully art professionals will know how to yeah. you know how to size their images. Well how to size that we could show uh, on a different webinar using a different using a tool I, I use sometimes called PicMonkey, PicMonkey.com and that allows you to size your images even if you don't have Photoshop. So once you know the pixel width should be, you can use PicMonkey.com to do that. Uh, okay, the third tip is that every time you have a blog post, you shouldn't have more than two paragraphs of text without a subheading of some sort. So that breaks up the blog post and it makes it more readable. So people can scan the post and get information just by scanning. So Interesting. <laughs> always use a picture, make sure it's the same width as the column of text, and um, put subheading that it will look visually better. Well, fantastic. That, that's all really insightful. I want to pick up on something you were saying just a few minutes ago when you were mentioning the, the kind of things that might inspire somebody to write a blog post. I can imagine that artists are often asked about, say, how, how to paint. Um, is this a good work of art? What are the latest exhibitions? What should I go attend? I can imagine that doing blog posts would be a fantastic way to really help establish credibility as an expert. What's your thinking on that in terms of what a blog can do and how an artist can put that across? I, I always recommend to plan out what types of content you're going to have so that you don't have too much of the same thing going out every time. So if you had 
uh, our latest art, our, our latest featured artist every single week, a different featured artist. It would look a bit same. So I would always say mix it up. And in order to mix it up, you plan ahead in different categories. <laughs> so if one of the types of blog posts will be a how-to blog post, brainstorm as many how-tos you can think of. And don't worry about whether you're going to write all of them, just brainstorm. Then think about as many featured artists that you can come up with that you'd like to feature in your blog. Then think of as many collections of interesting points that you'd like to feature that you can have. For example, if you're a gallerist and you have regularly paintings, you could have a collection of paintings with the sky in it or a collection of portraits and pull together from different exhibitions, different collections with similar content so that you can feature them in a blog post. So think about all the roundups that you could have. And then think about all the people you might want to interview. They could be clients of yours that have bought a piece of art, they could be artists themselves, a day in their life, it could be, um, people mm. terms that have worked for you that might want to give a little bit of insight on what it was like working at the gallery. Who could you interview? So, so far, we've got the how-to, the featured artist, the collection of different uh, elements within specific pieces, and interviews. And that's just four ideas. But you just continue to come up with as many in each category of posts. And then you mix it up and make sure that you have a randomization of how those go out. And then you have a shortage of content. And would you recommend that bloggers d a post at least, say, once every month, once every two weeks? I mean, is it something that somebody should put in a calendar? I can imagine a lot of art professionals being, um, you know, really responsive. So perhaps doing a blog on an exhibition when they so happen to go to an exhibition. I mean, so you're, you're talking about planning. So what, what really might somebody do in reality for that? Um. The more planning you can do, the better. If you think about how people have done, uh, how people do their magazines, they don't just, oh my god, I have to put out an article tomorrow. They have to months in advance. So the same thing with the blog. Although a lot can be spontaneous and news related, if you have certain, certain things planned ahead of time, it means that you know that you've got most of the work done in advance, and then you can fit in the spontaneous things in between. So. Um, if you look at your calendar for the next three months, the first thing you should look at is what events are you going to, what new things are happening in your business. Are there new people joining the business? Are you going somewhere? Are you attending an exhibition? Are you holding an exhibition? Put those into the calendar and know that you would want to mention those on your blog. Then in between that, put in the advice posts, interviews, guest blogs, how-tos, frequently asked questions, and all the other stuff, all randomized. And in terms of frequency, there's been studies that have said that once a week is a really good frequency to really see the difference in engagement and people getting in touch with requests for your services or inquiries or events, whatever it is that you want to Hmm. Well, of course, with Be Smart About Art, we do have a weekly blog ourselves, the Sunday reading blog, that is once a week, and that's been absolutely incredible for increasing engagement with our audience. <laughs> Excellent. So on, this, on the note of frequency of, of blog, and furthermore, we're talking about all of these fantastic ideas for what your content might be, how do you in fact get somebody to go to your blog? So there you are writing this incredible content about how to be an artist, how to be a gallerist, uh, what your experiences are, what the best exhibitions do to know. You're putting out all of this information. How does the world see it? There's so much out there. I, I do want to stress the importance of quality. I haven't really talked about how important it is. I mean, I, you, I've given you tips on formatting these to make them visually appealing, so they have really great, well-chosen images, subheadings, everything's properly sized. Before you go and start spreading your blog all over the place, make sure that you've got into the habit of creating good quality, both in the way that it's formatted and the writing. Your headlines need to be really catchy, they need to grab people. When you read the headline, you need to know what it is you're going to get out of it. You need to check your grammar, your spelling, your punctuation, 
need to look professional and get somebody else to check it for you because you've always missed it. So I'm, I'm under the assumption that your blogs are amazing and that everything you've written is well written, punchy, well separated out, easy to skim read. Then you go to share those blog posts. Okay? So I'm going to now give you how to get more people to read your blog posts. Okay. Excellent. We love it. As long as they're good enough. I mean, I mean, it takes practice to get good at this stuff. So if you've been blogging for a while, go back and tidy up your old posts before you go and share them with the world. Okay, so the first place, of course, is social media. That's what social media is all about. It's about sharing content. And people will share your content and you share other people's content. Um, so definitely, whenever you write a new blog post, go on to Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Google Plus and share your blog posts within those channels. But don't only talk about your own blog posts. Make sure you mix that up with conversation and curation, meaning when I say curation for social media, I mean finding other people's. Okay, Karen, I think we're back. We uh, we lost okay. our broadcast for a moment, but carry on. You were saying. Okay, so definitely share your blog posts on social media, but don't only talk about your own blog posts on social media. The idea with social media is to talk to other people, about other people, promote other people, and share other people's content, and then intersperse that with sharing your own amazing content. Uh, so that's one place. The next thing you can be doing is featuring your blog posts in your newsletters. So if you have a monthly newsletter that you send out, rather than writing a huge long essay or another blog post in a newsletter, do a short intro and then do a latest on our blog with a synopsis of the little, a little bit of information about each blog post and a link to those. This shouldn't be automated, it should be thought about and written properly, so it links to each blog post you might have done since the last newsletter. And that gets sent out to your mailing list. So there's sharing it on social media and putting it into your newsletter. The next place is you can put it into your email signature, so perhaps a link to your main blog page or my latest blog post and the title of that blog post, especially if it's something that you know will be relevant to a lot of the people that you know. And then the next place is specifically to prospects or clients or contacts that you think would be not only interested in what you have to say, but also would help them to convince them of whatever it is that you want to convince them. So if you've got a, a prospect who's thinking about buying from you and you then say, you know, send them a friendly email and say, by the way, I've also written this great article about choosing the right frame which I think you'd find useful and about how to match it within your interior design. That will be an extra added benefit to them and it also brings them back to your box. So Absol absolutely. One aspect that I thought was really interesting about what you just said was when you say have a new blog post, you can email in, in your email newsletter about that post. I'm guessing that that's a link and that that link then goes to your blog. So you're actually driving people from an email to the blog. Is that correct? It is, and it doesn't mean to, to your main blog page, it means to the specific blog post, because every blog post has its own unique URL, unique website address. And that's one of the exciting things about blogs, is that every time you make a new blog post, you add another page to your website. So your website is growing every time. So where you might have started with a 10-page website with a one blog post, you add another 50 blog posts in a year, you add a 60-page website without it looking cluttered because all of those extra pieces of content are in your blog. And if you're smart about it, you categorize them into sections so people can easily navigate between the types of blog posts. 
and as you quite rightly said, that does mean that people will stay on the website for longer as well for the fact that they will be looking through, probably gaining more, they'll be getting, or you'll be getting their trust, so no like trust as they say. Yeah, that's right. When people, I still see on my Google Analytics stats that people are finding blog posts I wrote two years ago that are still relevant today, but they're just finding it through Google. So, of course, even though you're doing social media or email signature or email newsletter and individual emails to people, you'll also get a bigger presence on Google just by the fact that you've got more content out there with keywords and phrases that people might Google and find your blog post. Now, I've got a couple of other burning questions here. One of them is, what is the importance of your audience being able to comment on a blog post? I've had a number of art professionals come to me and say, I put out these blog posts, nobody comments, what, what do I do? Tell me a bit about, uh, about that. I want to be upset about that. With, with any small business, it's very, your, act, your actual audience is quite small. It's not in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, it's in the hundreds. And that's okay, you're not, your blog is, you're not running a business only as a blog, you're using your blog to reinforce your business. So with one blog post a week, as what I recommend is a good frequency, you're never gonna get a huge volume of traffic that these huge blogs that post seven or eight blog posts a day and have a team of different writers contributing would get. So when you have millions of people coming to your blog, then you get more comments. But if you only have hundreds, the likelihood of people commenting is much lower. But it doesn't mean you're failing if you know that you're creating content that gives insight into your business personality and shows off your expertise and tells stories and shows creativity and, and beautiful images. So all of those things are still going to benefit you even if you don't have huge amounts of comments. And so you would say in that case that it's worth having the comment boxes as an option. Yeah, and also don't worry if um, people say, if you're worried that people will say stuff and then it's just going to appear and worried about any negativity. First of all, a lot of the time when you get comments, it won't even be real people, it'll be spam. And you can put spam filters on your blog to help prevent that, but it would sometimes still happen because people um, fill out those, like spammers, find ways of filling them out to make them look like they're normal English and they look like they're very complimentary. Oh, I've read your blog post and it's really interesting. I'll bookmark it for later. That stuff all the time. You think it's real, but it's not real. It's bad. So you can get flattered and feel good about it, but it's actually it's always real. Um, so, but it doesn't, you won't, those won't automatically appear. Normally with any WordPress blog, you get sent a message saying that someone's commented on your blog. And you can decide whether to Mark it as spam or approve it to be displayed. Another tip could be, if you want to, is to create a blog posse. This group of you and fellow people who are also blogging, maybe in similar industries or maybe in uh, related, like partner industries, for example, an interior designer, a property blogger, a tennis artist, and a gallerist, all could be making a decision to be a posse and commenting on each other's blogs that you get some commenting happening, some encouraging things, somebody reading your post and putting in stuff to, to start it, it uh, to start a conversation. And well, that and that sounds like a really clever approach as well. Yeah, so that's something you can also do. But I wouldn't get hung up on if you don't have any comments on your blog. It doesn't mean you're clear. It's a small business will never get. Well, that's right, and so many people now do have blogs as well, so as you grow your audience, you will grow the readership of your blog, and as you grow your social media presence, clearly, um, you'll again grow the number of people reading your blog. Now, I've got, um, I think, one more question for you today, really particularly, which is, how does one measure the success of a blog, and how does one see how many people are on the blog? How, how, does, how do you go about doing that? Well, with Google Analytics, you can see the traffic you get to blog posts, and you can see which of the blog posts you've got are the most popular. And that will give you insight into what types of things people are more likely to want more of. So 
whenever you look at any analytics or measurements, you should be learning from that in order to help to refine your approach and, and create more of what people want. Um, the other way to measure it is when you're sharing things on social media, you can measure the, the if you're sharing on Facebook how many likes and shares and impressions you, you got, or if you're sharing on, on Twitter, you can see how many retweets and comments you've got. And the, the, more you, the more you improve the quality of the headlines and the images and the topics, the more you'll get of, of those kinds of the more you expand your audience, so the more you engage with Twitter and create a, a bigger following that are people who want to talk to, the more you the more likes get on your Facebook page, obviously you get a wider reach. So you'd be measuring it on those in, in those ways. And then um, calls to action. If you are clear about what you want people to do, then put out those things into your blog posts and into your website. Perhaps you want them to sign up for a newsletter. Perhaps you want them to come to an event, perhaps you want them to get in touch. So put clear calls to action and measure how often people are getting in touch, signing up for things that are coming to your event. That's terrific. That's really insightful. Now, if you were going to give us one thing to take away from today's session on blogging for art professionals, what would that be? Um, well, you should rewatch this and learn as much as you can. If I talk quite fast, but I suppose look at other blogs. Don't think that you should only be looking at your own industry or your people you know, other artists' blogs or gallerists' blogs. Look at the blogs that are run by big um, bloggers and business blogs. Like, um, for example, Mashable.com is a social media blog, but the way they put the headlines and things they talk about are still relevant for any small blog. Inc.com, that's inc.com, they're really great because of the and they have great headlines and you can always learn a lot about headline writing, looking at great headlines. And then there's one called Mark Angel Hack Life, I'll just check the URL for you, um, because the, head, the headlines are great there, yeah. M-A-R-C-A-N-D-A-N-G-E-L, markandangel.com. So those kinds of blogs are really good to look at in order to learn more about formatting, headline writing, the types of things that people talk about and think about in the business world or in the personal development world that you can then apply to your own world. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for those tips. Karen, I want to say an, a huge thank you so much for today for your insights. And thank you as well to our audience for listening to us who will be taking away some top tips to have effective blogs. Now, in the nature of blogging and online marketing as a whole, be sure to follow Karen on Twitter at, at Top Left Design. Also, be sure to see the Top Left Design website and blog. That's at topleftdesign.com forward slash blog. And Karen does have a website dedicated to blogging effectively as well and that's makemyblog.co.uk for those of you who are based in or near London do check out the details of next Friday's workshop with Karen on blogging and Facebook for art professionals that's taking place again next Friday the 31st of May starting at 2.30 in the afternoon going until 5 o'clock full details of that can be seen at be smart about art.com so be sure as well when you book your place use the discount code that we've prepared for that that's be extra smart b e e x t r a smart s s m a r t and you'll get a huge discount so you only pay 100 pounds as an investment for a jump packed two and a half hour session with a small group of fellow art professionals with Karen so everybody thanks so much for tuning in to today's BSAA webinar on isolated in cyberspace. We look forward to seeing you online on Twitter at, at BeSmartAboutArt and of course at our own blog at BeSmartAboutArt.com. We're signing off. Bye. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you.